Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to another Horus Heresy lore breakdown. We are still on Prospero Burns, and we rejoin our heroes as Eben Ruster has decided to get into a fight with members of a local Imperial Guard armor unit. It turns out, much to Eben's surprise and benefit, that the Space Wolves have rebuilt him more efficiently than he had at first thought, and he goes on to severely maul several members of the Imperial Army. <laughs> No doubt, contributing yet more to the much-beloved reputation of the Space Wolves. And, possibly as a result of some form of perceived relativistic penis envy, the Jarl of Tra decides that he too wishes to demonstrate that he can fuck up somebody's day as well, and so decides to drop an entire orbital dockyard on top of the Quietude's capital. Granted, this was not quite as unnecessarily as savage a strategy as it may initially appear, because the Quietude had utilized their technology to expand the polar ice caps of their planet into a massive globe-encomposing shield, and this was an expedient way to create a hole in said shield, through which a far greater calamity was then able to enter, the Space Wolves. Apparently, they also took great joy in delivering stories of these attacks to Eben, specifically focusing on the more vicious and overtly violent aspects of the story, even completely detached from other aspects of it. They would focus on how they brutally dismembered and de facto tortured Quietude soldiers, which Eben at first found confusing. He even considered it maybe to be some form of exaggeration, perhaps. But that that is apparently not very likely, as there were no braggarts in Tra, or at least so he was reassured. And Eben also recalls an engagement on one of the orbital platforms that were occupied by the Quietude, where the Space Wolves had, again, very brutally and almost ritualistically dismembered one of their soldiers. And at the time, it was explained to him that the Space Wolves were driving out the Maleficarum, hurting it so badly that it would not wish to return any time soon. This practice clearly has a root in Fenrisian tradition, where if somebody was possessed by a demon, Maleficarum, then the best way to get rid of that demon and ensuring that he didn't want to come back was to teach it pain, in the words of the Space Wolves. This is another one of those interesting little things where, on the one hand, the Space Wolves are very clearly aware of their reputation, and are very willing to utilize that reputation to their benefit. Indeed, parts of the reputation, at the very least, seem to be specifically manufactured to achieve this goal. But, on the other hand, you also have aspects of them that are very clearly tribal, um, primitive and savage, like this. The belief that a demon can be chased out of a victim by, well, scaring the living shit out of it. Though, of course, on the other hand, this is the 41st millennium, or 31st to be precise, but the point still remains, namely that demons actually do exist in this reality. And they can experience pain, or at the very least an emotion that we would compare to human pain. And, well, you know, it's worth a shot, I suppose. And it's also interesting in another regard as well. So, in 40k, demons are of course real. The Emperor has chosen to try and fight against chaos by basically banning all information about chaos. Humanity cannot possibly worship something that they do not know exist. And if all religion is also outright banned, then there is no way for the Chaos Gods to create proxies of themselves to gain power and worship from. Okay, that seems to be a pretty damn good strategy, at least the Chaos Gods seem to think it's a very good strategy, because they're getting kinda desperate. In the case of the Space Wolves, though, we see an alternative approach, where the Space Wolves know about demons, they call them Maleficarum, and they have these basic, tribalistic, fairly primitive ways of driving out Maleficarum, which, again, whilst basic, whilst primitive, they may very well be effective. 
there is a kernel of truth to their belief. If you hurt the demon bad enough, maybe it will keep it out. The basic logic behind it is, relatively speaking, sound, and it also allows the Imperium to maintain plausible deniability, you know? Oh, no, no, this isn't real, this is just some kind of tribal ritual stuff and stuff, while still allowing the Space Wolves to be, potentially, a good weapon against chaos. But, of course, this is entirely based on the assumption that demons give a shit about being hurt. Now, we do know that they do feel pain, to a certain extent, you know, a feeling like we would call pain. But they are also so incredibly desperate for the real world, which is the source of their power, their intellect, their energy, their sustenance, their drug of choice, basically, that I just don't know if any amount of pain will ever truly convince them to not try and come back. Nevertheless, it's an interesting idea. Another little interesting piece is we are introduced to the very first Longfang, a Space Wolf of Terran origin. He is the oldest of the Space Wolves at the time, and it is mentioned that if other Space Wolves were to live for as long as he, then maybe they too would become Longfangs. Which of course, we know to be true, suggesting also that the 41st millennium is a wee bit on the quieter side compared to the 31st. Our venerable Longfang also goes on to poke and prod at Eben, asking why he decided to come to Fenris, what motivated him to come to such a world, what motivated him to try and contact the Legion Astartes and attempt to, well, record their exploits, I suppose. And Eben's explanation is not a particularly good one. He himself even seems to understand that, and I do love how this is a consistent theme throughout the book. We return to the whole thing about a good mystery here, and this is part of it. All of these little hints that they deliver through this poking and prodding into Eben that he doesn't quite understand, but at the end comes together as a greater whole. Ah, I wish a certain other author had done this, but Oh well, we'll get back to the mystery when it is actually revealed, because I feel it's more... correct like that. Oh, and also, on the note of even going to the wolves being such a strange thing, this is before the Remembrancer Order. The Longfang mentions that this is around the time when Ulanor is being brought to a close, and Horus has been announced as Warmaster, and the Emperor is withdrawing, meaning that this is well and truly before the Remembrance Order, so even is probably the first of his kind to do this, or at least as far as we know, making his actions all the more suspicious, no doubt. Oh, and also, remember that thing that the Space Wolves dropped on the Quietude to make a larger hole in their polar ice cap shield? It turns out that that was more than just a large thing, an unmanned vessel, which of course the Space Wolves assumed to be a kill vessel, because why else would you have a massive unmanned spacecraft? The theory in that particular regard is not exactly unsound. I mean, you have a very, very, very large thing, a solid object, presumably filled full of all manners of fuel, propellants, and potentially explosives, and no crew. Hmm. Suspicious indeed. However, it turns out that in reality, it was a rocket to be launched into the depths of space, and it contained the entire repository of quietude knowledge and culture. Their art, their history, their philosophy, their stories, their Kama Sutra, etc, etc. This was only discovered after the Space Wolves had dropped them onto that very same quietude, and it created a bit of a mess. Imperial High Command, apparently, were not overly fond of this, though I must ask myself why this is some dirty, filthy Xeno species. Well, technically, they did have their origin in humanity, but nevertheless, you'd think that pretty much everything they had produced and contained within that data spectrum would be considered uh, problematic at the absolute least. Then again, the Imperium of the 31st millennium is a bit wonky on this. Apparently they've even done full-on peace treaties with Xeno species, cooperated with them, and offered 
essentially alliances. And the Adept Mechanicus are also far more interested in reverse engineering Xenos tech than they are in the modern day Imperium, to a quite considerable degree, so I guess it is not beyond the uh, scope of possibility that this would be considered a bit of a lost cultural treasure, though even then the apparently vehement reaction is... I don't know, it seems a bit overstated, perhaps? I mean, the Space Wolves too, even if they knew what it was, would they actually care? I mean, come on, come on. It's a bunch of vile Xenos tech, basically. Dropping that on top of the vile Xenos, and hell, they're even worse than vile Xenos. They were once perfection, humanity, flawless, and fully formed, and then they made themselves into some kind of monstrous half-human, half-machine hybrid. They should be an enemy beneath all contempt, one would think, but eh. I guess another explanation too would be that Imperial High Command, already having a bit of a testy relationship with the wolves, simply panicked and feared that this would be viewed as another act of unnecessary cruelty and barbarism on behalf of the wolves, and that act would in turn reflect poorly upon the Imperial Army elements. Mm. I like that theory better, really, because, well, I can certainly see that happening considering the wolves' overly combative relationship with the army. And on that note, we also get to hear a bit more about Ulanor, which I find really fascinating. The Space Wolves have developed what appears to be a purposefully combative relationship with the Imperial Army, and indeed most other branches of Imperial government, but they do not mind at all that Horus has been made Warmaster. They are not disappointed, they are not surprised, they all saw this coming. None of them expected for it to be Lehman Russ, for they have a very clear idea of the Imperium. Each of the Emperor's sons has a predetermined destiny, a role to play in the Imperium, and Lehman Russ's role is not to be the leader. It never has been, and so they don't care. And in sharp contrast to how they treat the army, the reason why they would want to be at Ulanor was not because it was a particularly wonderful campaign or because they really want to fight the Greenskins, it was to be at the Great Triumph, so that they could stand foremost amongst brothers, making their unequivocal, unquestionable allegiance to the new Warmaster clear to everyone. For unwashed, uneducated, tribal savages, the Space Wolves sure do have a solid grasp on where they belong in the world. If only Magnus and Horus had had half their clarity of purpose, this whole sorry mess could probably have been avoided. Speaking of sorry messes, so Ibn decides that he wishes to go down onto the planet as the wolves are uh, <clears throat> brutalizing it, because as he has been told, he is a scald, and well, nobody would ever tell him not to go anywhere, so off he hops, reassured that the wolves will protect him. Unfortunately in this case, um, they don't so much protect him as in escort him as, you know, uh, hope to be in the right place at the right time. This somewhat unstructured approach to Eben's safety results in Longfang being the only one nearby when Eben runs into a couple super robusts, giant cyborg monster things with two heads and very very large hammers. And to prevent Eben from being turned into a wet splodge on the landscape, Longfang has to put himself between Eben and one of those very large hammers resulting in the venerable wolf getting turned into a less wet splodge on the landscape, but a splodge nonetheless. What follows then is several sequences where Eben tells a story to Longfang, and Longfang tells it back in kind of a semi-dreamlike state, like they're really there or psychically connected or something like that, where 
Again, Longfang is trying to probe into Eben's conditioning, and in return, allowing Eben a bit more of an insight into Longfang's own story. There are a couple of hints here as to the Horus heresy, like the Vajet, the Eye of Horus, being duplicitous, but having its nature, good or evil, dependent upon its wielder, and so on and so on, but since this is a de facto dream sequence, one should not read too much into this, beyond the obvious, like the Wajet, Horus being good or evil depending on who he is currently being steered by, be it the Emperor or the Chaos Gods, that's a relatively obvious one, although it does suggest that perhaps Horus would be easier to influence than we at first thought. Perhaps, in reality, the lie that the Chaos Gods told them was not as flimsy as it seemed. I mean, it was a pretty clever one, like, oh look, the future, you're not here, ha ha ha, that means the Emperor betrayed you, except not really. But maybe, just maybe, Horus is easier to steer even than that. Perhaps this is hinting at an underlying need on Horus' side to be guided? Though, now we're really, really extrapolating a lot based off fairly little. And speaking of fairly little, we also get a bit of a strange conversation between Eben and Longfang's successor, who is also a psycho, which explains why Longfang could do the things he did to Eben, showing him the scene so clearly and interfering with his mind. Eben seems surprised, almost shocked, to learn that the Space Marines have psychers, that their shamans may have a real gift, and even says something as special as, are you telling me I live in a world of magic? This is really odd. Eben knows about psychers. Surely he must know. It is no secret that the Imperium utilizes psychers. Indeed, throughout the conversation, they speak as if this is completely common knowledge. Astropaths and navigators. I mean, I can understand that he's a bit surprised that the Legion Astartes use them, simply because of the rarity of, well, Legionnaires and the rarity of psychic gifts on top of that, but. To conflate this with sorcery seems so odd, especially for somebody that is basically a scientist of sorts. Huh. I don't really know what to make of that, honestly. It just, it's an oddity. That's hardly overly material, especially considering the events we are about to see unfold. The Council of Nikea. We got to see this from the perspective of the Thousand Suns a few episodes ago, which was rather interesting, and now we get to see it from the perspective of the Space Wolves, who have shown up in considerable force. Three full companies. Three full great companies, to be precise. That's a lot of wolves. And the reason for there being so many is because, well, Big E himself, along with the wolves, no doubt, worry that should the findings of an Ikea end up in opposition to certain parties, violence might ensue. In which case, the Space Wolves' primary objective is to get the Emperor the hell out of Dodge, and anything that attempts to intervene in or delay that objective gets butchered. But most interestingly, we will get to see the opposite side of Otha Viridmake. Those of you who remember the Thousand Suns video, or have read the book, will remember that Otha Virdmek and Ariman developed a bit of a friendship, despite the fact that both of them were essentially ordered to do so by their respective Primarchs. However, during the Council of Nikea, Otha Virdmek would seemingly stab the Thousand Suns in the back and his testimony ended up being instrumental in the final conclusion of Nikea deciding to outlaw the Librarians in the Legions, placing a de facto ban on the Legioni Sestati's use of psychic powers. So why would he do this? Why would Otho Eirmek, in despite of his apparent friendship, hurt himself as well as his friend Ariman?
Because, of course, the Space Wars 2 use psychers. They use a librarius, although they don't quite call it that. They... See, this is part of the hypocritical nature of it that is a little bit difficult to truly discern. The Space Wolves keeps insisting that their psychers are different, that their seers are different, and they seem to suggest that the very nature of their power is different, whilst also when it comes to Eben, well, Longfang's successor admitted that yes, this is psychic power. Is this a play on behalf of the Space Wolves? Is this another aspect of their uh, a brutish ignorance where they simply pretend to be unaware of the greater mysteries of the universe? Or do they really think that there is something different, something purer with their magic? Because there undoubtedly is something very different with their way of practicing magic. The Thousand Suns is of the opinion that no knowledge is ever too far. No boundaries should ever remain untested, whilst the Space Wolves are far more conservative. They wish to stay on safe ground, and limit themselves to the areas that they have fully explored, and are as safe as they can, relatively speaking, make them. But that is a little bit on the speculative side, so let us move on to the Space Wolves deciding to pick on Eben Rusta. As the three gathered Jarls have decided that yes, it is indeed time to bully the mortal, and so sends him off to the Quiet Room, a special little chamber within Nikea where the Wolf King sits, secretively, sort of, surrounded by Sisters of Silence. It is almost a little bit difficult to figure out which one is more uncomfortable for poor little Eben. Being near Lehman Russ, a physically imposing enough entity at the best of times, in a small, dark, confined room, on a volcano planet in the sweltering heat, or being next to six Sisters of Silence. I would like to call your attention to the video I did about psychic blanks in 40k in case you are unaware of just how uncomfortable it would be for a regular human to be nearby a blank. And in this case, we're also talking about the Sisters of Silence, high level blanks. Being near one of these ladies would be like if you had a severe fear of small and close spaces, and also of snakes, spiders, and caterpillars, and you were then placed inside of a very small box buried beneath the ground, and the box is also filled with snakes, spiders, and caterpillars. And probably some venomous frogs as well, just for good measure. And it's also here that we get our first little hint that something is really not like it's supposed to be. Lehman Russ has of course been briefed on Eben and his peculiarities. Now, within the psychically deadening aura of the Sisters of Silence, he tries to speak to Eben in Wurgen, the battle cant of the Space Wolves, yet Eben suddenly does not understand. Huh. Well, that's odd, isn't it? The Space Wolves insisted that they had done nothing to his mind, they had not implemented the knowledge there, and yet He's been speaking Wurgen and Heart Chant and all of the other languages of Fenris without any issues whatsoever. And yet now, suddenly, face to face with Lehman Russ, he forgets it all. How mystical indeed. Well, those of you who have read the book, of course, already know, those of you who have not might be starting to add two and two together, the appearance of the Thousand Suns earlier on in the story, the constant poking and prodding from the Space Wolves as to why Eben even went to Fenris in the first place, and if he had any idea why he was actually there now, and why he stayed with the Space Wolves. And Lehman Russ puts all of this in a very neat point. He states to Eben that him coming to the Quiet Room and losing his command of Uvik and Vurgan proves that his mind has been tampered with, although as of yet he still refuses to say who. The two then enter into a conversation about the Null Maidens, their role, why they are there, why the Space Wolves are there, and Lehman Russ explains that they are there to mask the presence of both himself, Lehman Russ, and his three great companies of wolves. Whilst they are gathered in these specific areas, his brother, 
referring almost certainly to Magnus, cannot detect them. And so, in Lehman Ross's own words, their presence cannot, um, unnerve him. <laughs> To be fair, if I was Magnus and I was sent a urgent message to show up at a desolate planet that was once a volcanic asteroid in the middle of nowhere, and there were three companies of space wars waiting for me, I might be starting to get a little bit nervous, yes, I must admit. But again, this demonstrates just how sophisticated the wolves can be. A little bit later on, we get a conversation between Lehman Russ and Constantine Valdor of the Custodes, where Constantine is so blunt about it as to say that Lehman Russ's barbarian king act is very charming and all, but they've got real business to attend to. <laughs> See, I've said this before, but I love this character development for Russ because it makes so much sense. I'd always thought that this kind of barbaric Primarch thing was a little odd just because of how intelligent Primarchs are. Somebody like Lehman Russ, even if raised on a world like Fenris, would almost certainly start recognizing quite quickly that his intellect outstripped those around him, and he'd probably start you know, putting two and two together. Like, for example, the fact that the heavens were not merely just the oververse, and that there might actually be something out there. And when, of course, the Emperor arrived and showed him spaceships and guns, etc., he would very quickly have civilized. But, of course, if he also recognizes the value in his barbaric heritage, particularly considering his chosen profession as executioner, then that would be very different. Of course, Russ was raised on a world that values strength, that values power, but also that values consistent subterfuge. How valuable is land when you never know how long it's going to be above the sea? How much will you fight for it? What will you sacrifice? When will you choose to move on? How will you gain alliances when everybody is competing for the same land? And so on and so on and so on. It makes a lot more sense for the Space Wolves to be hiding this level of complexity than them just remaining, well, space-roaming barbarians, you know? So I really do like this. I think that this is something that could perhaps be built upon a little bit more, since right now, whilst there is a better basis for this than Lorgar, for example, suddenly going like, Oh my, what have I done? Exactly what you've been planning for the last... Decade, look, uh, that's what. I mean, at least here, the grounding is laid. When we see Eben's interaction with the Space Wolves, this is all built up to, and we have a relatively firm foundation. But I would like to see even more of this, specifically from Lehman Russ's perspective, would be great. And especially from Lehman Russ's perspective in how he interacts with his brothers. For whilst Constantine Valdor might be wise to Russ's tricks, a lot of his brothers, interestingly enough, appear to be completely unaware that Ross is putting on a facade at all. Now, some of them hint at knowing to certain degrees, but others seem to genuinely believe that he is the barbaric warlord that he pretends to be. So, again, some more flesh on this would be really cool. We also now learn that it was indeed Lehman Russ who pushed for the censor of the Thousand Suns, although they mentioned specifically the word censor. So, I don't know whether or not the Space Wolves were pushing for the banning of the Librarius, or if they simply wanted to give Magnus a bit of a slap on the wrist, so to say. Although it is also revealed that the Censor of the Thousand Suns appeared to be far more wide-reaching and popular than originally anticipated. During a meeting with Lehman Russ, Fulgrim, and the Custodes, poor little Eben, feeling a hint overshadowed at this point, is given a debriefing where the Primarchs and the Custodes explain to him that he may very well have been groomed for a position as the Thousand Suns' de facto spy for a very, 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 very long time, and perhaps his departure for Fenris was also engineered by them. 
As the Conservatory, an organization that, in Eben's opinion, appeared to be on the edge of being subsumed into the Administratum, losing all of its authority and independence, was in reality on the cusp of becoming a major political power, and an independent political power at that, under the aegis of Malkador himself. But of course, if this were to happen, then all of his frustration, the things that the Thousand Sons were using to steer and control him, would immediately evaporate. And so, they had to make a move swiftly. That may also have been the reason why they did so in such a haphazard fashion. The delivery of Eben to Fenris was, um, hardly subtle or artful, shall we say and the Space Wolves immediately suspected that something was wrong, which is why they put him on ice for 19 great years. This in turn also of course gave Lehman Russ a clear example of the Thousand Suns overstepping their boundaries. He could hold Eben up to other Primarchs, and potentially the Emperor and Malkador as well, who both apparently were sympathetic to Eben's work and go, look at what they did to this guy, this guy that you actually know and you're kind of a fan of. That certainly would be a fairly persuasive argument for maybe giving Magnus a bit of a slap across the wrist. Not only because he objectively did something that could be interpreted as wrong, but because he did it to somebody that Malkador and potentially even the Emperor were personally fond of. And speaking of personal feelings, we are now going to enter into an area in which I have strong negative personal emotions. I like this book. There's a lot of really, really cool stuff about this book. The mystery, for example, and the slow unraveling of that mystery, the aha moments, the way they do Lehman Ross, the way they do the Space Wolves, and so on. But this whole name nonsense and the suggestions that knowing somebody's name gives you power over them in a mystical slash magical slash psychic sense, this thing I don't like, because that isn't 40k. Now there are some suggestions in 40k that knowing the true name of a demon gives you power over it, and that can be explained via the warp being the warp. If we believe through ancient history, through ancient myths and tales, that knowing a demon's true name will give us power over it, then that is exactly how it will be. Of course, you could then enter into the question of how the fuck does a demon have a true name to begin with? A demon does not have parents, it does not have kin. Where exactly did it receive this name from? Was it gifted this name by its liege, its demonic masters, by Korn or Zinch, etc? Or is its true name, the name slash word, it was originally referred to by, say, humans or Eldar or whatever species encountered it first? It raises a hell of a lot more questions than it does answers. And in the case of a demon, the reason why the name has power over them is because they are demonic creatures. They are bound by the laws of the warp. And the laws of the warp, again, is bound by reality. How we perceive reality. And so, since it's a common myth and history and belief that knowing a demon's true name gives you power over it, then in some way, shape or form, the warp will make it so that demons have a true name and that knowing that name will give you power over them. But this is entirely the warp's doing, and the only reason why the name gives you power is because it is over a warp entity who must obey those rules. Humans, however, are not warp entities. We are not bound by that logic. Now, you could potentially have a psyker whose specific power is that, Having knowledge of somebody's name gives you power over them, possibly, as there is no real hard and fast rule on precisely what a psychic power can and cannot be. A psychic power that exists only if certain circumstances were met, entirely possible. But suffice to say, that is not the case here, as will be revealed a bit later on. There is also a distinction to be made between how the warp affects things, because you might think that, okay, if humans believe that knowing somebody's true name gives you power over another human, then surely that is how it works, right? 
Not really, because it appears as if that is primarily over inanimate objects. Presumably it has something to do with the fact that humans are alive, that they have a soul and so on. But there does not appear to be any mentions of the warp shaping people or living things. Even the Eldar at the height of their power when they could literally raise gravity defying structures by simply creating a warp entity that allowed that, did not appear to be able to mold themselves, so to say. And there is also no suggestion that the old ones were able to do so. They had to create specific species and races by creating them in a biological sense, and then programming them via an advanced system of mental and physical conditioning. Now, that can in turn result in psychic species with very specific psychic powers, a la, for example, the orcs, but at the top of my mind at least, I cannot come up with a single example of a warp-born rule applying to a living creature. You know, along the lines of red ones go faster, work because they paint their trucks red. In which case, the thing they are imbuing with the power to make things go faster is not even necessarily the truck, but the paint. This is also why Orc War Paint in uh, Warhammer Fantasy has an actual effect. It gives them a ward save, because the Orcs, being creatures that can manipulate the warp on an instinctual basis, believe that painting themselves blue will actually protect them from damage. And of course, we could also go into the whole question of what is a true name? Who determines what your true name is? In the case of Ibn Rusta, he was adopted by Rector Uwe, who gave him his original name, Kaspar Hauser. And then he started going under the name of Ibn amongst the Space Wolves. So which name has the power? Can anyone give you a name as long as you haven't been given a name before? And how do we know that his parents hadn't given him a name that we simply don't know about? And so on and so on and so on and so on. I don't like this, because it is far too much magical and far too little warp. What I love about the warp in 40k is that it is explained. We know how the warp works. We know how psychic powers work. There is an entire massive tome explaining this. And yet this book ignores that and instead simply states knowing a person's name gives you power over them. Why? Because magic. Right, okay. Well, no. <laughs> that is a very large departure from how 40k works and I don't like it. Especially when it comes to the Custodes, and their names made up of God only knows how many hundreds of words, which once again brings us back to what is actually a true name, but you know what? I could literally go on about this for basically ever, so I'm just gonna stop it there and move on. As Eben is confronted by Amun, the captain of the Ninth Fellowship of the Thousand Sons. He has used his knowledge of the Custodes name to freeze him in place. Some fucking how. I guess, again, Custodes names are blah blah blah. I've already been over this. Moving on. Moving on. But of course it is not Amon. We know this, it's hinted at quite clearly, and after having read the first book, of course, we know for a fact that Amon at this point in time was with his Primarch and could not possibly have been with Eben as well. The Space Wolves and Eben, of course, would have no real way of knowing this, although the Custodes should have. I mean, they're responsible for the security of this false little planetoid upon which the Council of Nikea is held. Surely they have surveillance devices everywhere, especially on Magnus of all people. And it should be pretty obvious to just, you know, flick on a camera and go, right, um, Amon appears to be next to uh, Magnus, whilst he's also apparently accosting the Space Wolf Skald. This is unusual, but no, of course not, because once again, the Custodes are fucking morons. <laughs> Apparently, the moronic custodies in the first heretic were not the exception, but instead the rule. Which is nice to know, I suppose. Otherwise, you might come to the mistaken conclusion that a group of seasoned professionals that have been occupying themselves with the safety of the god emperor for hundreds of years might know a thing or two about surveillance. Which again, obviously would be the incorrect conclusion. <laughs> 
At least the Space Wolves had laid a trap. They moved Eben outside of the protective sphere of influence of the Sisters of Silence, thereby revealing him to the Thousand Sons, and they hoped that this would cause whoever it was that had been manipulating him to step forward, in an effort to reconnect and perhaps even gather the intelligence that their spy had, presumably, gathered over the course of his stay with the Space Wolves. And this seemed to have worked in that they caught Amon, or what appeared to be Amon, but again, the custodians should have known that it was not him, or at the very least that something was wrong, because again, not only should they have kept the entirety of Nikea under continuous surveillance, but they should definitely have been keeping an extra eye out on somebody as important as Amon, an equerry to Magnus himself, and... If there is indeed some truth in the suggestion that this was a de facto trial of Magnus, then even more reason to keep an eye on him and his closest compatriots. But once again, that would make far too much sense apparently. And speaking of sense, <laughs> yes, 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 we finally arrive at perhaps the dumbest part of the name thing. I said I was done, but I forgot about this part. So let's just skip right over the whole debate about whether or not it's hypocrisy that the Space Wolves use psychic powers. Because at the end of the day, that is simply a question of degrees, which the Space Wolves themselves say, you know, our magic is okay because we use it in certain ways in certain controlled facets, and the Thousand Suns, okay, that makes a certain degree of sense, but you see, we understand more about this thing, and so we can push further and yet still remain in control. Both views have certain validity to them, and when you're dealing with something as loose and fluffy as the warp and its corrupting influence and so on and so on, it's very difficult to really come up with any true answer to the question. Although I do agree that the Space Wolves are a wee bit on the hypocritical side, since they clearly do think that their way of using it is different, you know, as if they don't quite want to admit that they're using the warp in the same way. But here comes the dumbest thing. The demon, pretending to be Amon, manages to freeze Hellwinter because he knows his name. However, when he throws himself at Bear, shouting his name, it has no effect, because Bear's name is not Bear, it is Björn, which means Bear in, well, Norwegian and Swedish and most Scandinavian languages, really. Alright? But what about Hellwinter? If this guy's name is something in Norwegian or whatever, then why is Hellwinter in English? Why isn't that... Helvetsvinted, for example. Why does this have effect whilst the other does not? Is it because uh, Eben now understands Yuvik after all? But if that was true, why does he not know that Bear isn't Bear but instead Björn? Why hasn't he realized? And if it's because of his psychic uh, conditioning, which means that he, you know, understands it, but he basically translates it in his head and doesn't understand on an intellectual level that he understands it, then surely Hellwinter would have been translated incorrectly as well. In fact, every single name that he had learned should be essentially pointless as far as the Space Wolves are concerned. And yet, now it works, which for the, what, third, fourth time brings us back to the definition of what is a true name? <laughs> Because surely, if Bear means Björn, then that is his name, it is just in a different language. So does that mean that if you have... like, Say for example that if you have a name that means something in a language, like um, for example in Japanese, Sakura, that is a name, but it's also a reference to um, the um, cherry blossoms. So, does that mean that it's not correct, because it could be an object as well? It could be Cherry Blossoms instead of the name? Does that mean it doesn't count as a name? Like, oh, it's just... this... I hate this thing! <laughs> because, again, the deeper you look into it, the dumber it becomes, and the more questions you have, and it is the exact opposite of how psychic powers have been defined in 40k up until this point. It's... Ugh. <laughs> 
And of course, I also have to mention that Amon still apparently has power over the custodies Amon Taramakian, but he only needs to call him Amon Taramakian. The other 700 parts of his name are apparently irrelevant. So, once again, yet another question. Where's the fucking cutoff point? No, no. You know what? This time, I promise, I will never mention this bullshit again because it's just... It doesn't make sense and it's the weakest point of this book by far. Bear then proceeds to beat the shit out of the demon pretending to be a moon, subdues him, and then carves a mark of aversion onto his armor, which then really properly reveals that he's a demon by, you know, vomiting out warp stuff all over the place and going insane. But instead of weakening uh, the demon, the mark of aversion apparently just drives it insane enough to get up, break free of Bjorn, and then run off whilst also being able to avoid the custodies. <laughs> who, of course, once again, had apparently not bothered installing security cameras or throwing up a proper cordon. Now, granted, they were trying to catch a demon, so, you know, it could do all kinds of bullshit to sneak away, but... Ah, custodies. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. I hope they get a book in the future that shows them to be something more than just bad at their jobs. It would be nice, but oh well. This little happening is then presented to the Emperor as further evidence of Magnus's wrongdoing, which is also really interesting. I mean, yeah, this does paint a pretty nasty picture of the Thousand Sons, yes, and since the Custodians didn't bother keeping track of Amun, they might actually just assume that that was Amun from the Thousand Sons, because again, although they should have known better, they don't actually know better. The odd thing is, why don't they then arrest Amun? I mean, he's with Magnus, he's still on Nikea, you let him go. He didn't just escape all over the place, like, he was still there. <laughs> and the real Amun had no idea this was going on, so he would have absolutely no reason to hide or try and avoid the custodies. They should have been able to just, well, knock on his door and he would open it for them and go like, yes, and that would be it. But they chose not to for reasons, I guess. The book here just kind of skips forward. The events of Nikea is completely passed over, we of course know what happened there, and then we end up back with the Space Wolves trying to pry further into the mind of Eben, going so far as to trying something rather experimental, shall we say, that ends up, um, in a less than entirely ideal result, which we will touch upon in part three. Yes, I was figuring I might go ahead and do the rest in this one, but there's still, like, two hours left of the audiobook I'm going over to refresh myself, and in the book, the last parts were a little bit weighty, so I'm gonna go ahead and make a part three. So, until then, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.